Hi, I'm Kenton Zervin, a teacher and designer of Edible Landscapes, and you are going to get a tour in this video of the Lacombe Park Community Garden. This is a phenomenal project that involves a city, a church donating their land, and community group. Let's go for a quick tour. So this landscape has been optimized for sun, water, and people. And what we're going to be seeing here is terraces. We've used logs given to us by arborists, put them on contour so that water is captured behind them. And that water then goes to fruit trees. So what we have in this row is Saskatoons, gojis, and you can see these beautiful goji berries starting to come on here. You're familiar with them often dried, but they're wonderful fresh as well. And we've got beaked hazelnuts. And that's just the first row. The row we passed that was lower down is all hascaps and hundreds of them. Just yesterday we were here with a new community group that just came on out and we planted over 50 hascap bushes to add to the project. This project now has over 150 fruit trees and shrubs and it's all free for community, installed by community with city support. I've done about five or six of these projects now in the province. So um, I had worked with the, one of the, the organizers in the community group before on actually another food forest that's just a couple blocks from here. So when the land came up to the, the owner of the church said, hey, I want to use this land lit differently. She piped in and said, well, how about we make this a food forest and edible landscape? And I know just the guy. So I came on board the project and did a design for them. And then I led them in the install, teaching people how to plant these trees and utilize their space. There's lots of names for this. Edible landscaping is the term everyone gets, but the true name in permaculture is called food forestry. The idea that we could copy the structure and process of a forest, but substitute the species so they're all edible. And that's what we have here. We've got apples, plums, cherries, saskatoons, hascaft, beet hazelnuts, gojis, and more. <laughs> so gojis are a very hardy uh, fruit shrub. There is, sometimes can even be considered invasive. There's actually a wide variety of them in the Edmonton River Valley. The kind that we have here are uh, more of a, a taller tree instead of a shrub. And um, they are a orange berry that you can use in your salads or you can juice or you can freeze. Uh, you can eat them fresh as well. Most people will dry them and they'll use them in like a trail mix or eat them just fresh dried. Food forests allow people to connect with their food again in a way that's not laborious or overly laborious. When most people think about food, they think annuals. And there's a lot of work that goes into making a garden or a monoculture agriculture system. But trees grow themselves. Yes, you need to put the energy in to plant them. Yes, you got to make sure they stay alive. But then after that, year after year after year, they keep producing food for you. This is an untapped resource of how we use the sun's energy and convert it into sugars for humans. Food is often underappreciated and uh, people aren't even thinking about where it comes from. This allows our food to come right to us locally, nearby, from our own soils. So it allows people to reconnect to their land again and reconnect to their food supply, which most people feel very disconnected from. I would say that food is the number one topic of sustainability. We can talk about Tesla cars and solar panels all day long, but if we don't address the migration of our soils and waters around the planet in completely unsustainable systems, we don't have a chance. We need to readdress where does our food come from and how do we connect to our land bases again? How do we ensure that we are net positive, not just sustainable? And one of the ways we do that is we use species that are hardworking, capture carbon, store it in, in organic sources, produce our food locally, and the many other benefits that trees offer. There absolutely is. The most effective way of storing carbon is with organic matter. Trees are our carbon sinks. These are our ways to capture and store carbon. They were the original one. They are the original solar panel. They're extremely effective at everything they do. Think of all the ecosystem services that they offer, that they offer temperature regulation, that they offer, um, uh, that they actually encourage precipitation. So trees are evapotranspiring water, and what that does is it seeds clouds. So when you actually think about climate change, these stabilize your climate. 
They stabilize your climate by producing more even moisture amounts, by actually seeding more clouds. Also by holding water in their body. They, if, you, uh, if you look at a, tr a forest, it's actually an above ground lake. And anyone who's lived near a lake knows that the temperature is more moderate around it because it's a big thermal mass battery. So plants do that for us by not just evapotranspiring and cooling the air around them, but by actually being a, a store of water themselves above the ground. So the climate change is real, and me, me, most of us don't appreciate just how much these hard-working plants are doing for us. I need to caution people that you have to work with what your local climate is. We're in kind of a zone 3A, B area, and uh, honestly, I have so many that I love to use but uh, a gooseberry is just one cool one that you can use. You often see these as a garnish in cooking, but this one, mm, it's almost ready for eating. It's getting there. Um, there you go, have one. <laughs> I love using Saskatoons. I love using gojis. I love using baked hazelnuts. These are Saskatoons and beet hazelnuts are a great native species. You can find them out in the bush even. Um, I like using sea buckthorn, which is also a very hardy nitrogen fixing uh, tree. And it has a bright orange berry. The leaves can be used for tea. Uh, the fruit can be eaten fresh. It can be dried into leather. It can be frozen and added to your smoothies. And it uh, can be uh, used as a buffer species. It's so tough, you can plant it on the outsides of your property if you're in a more rural environment, and it'll actually help break the winds the same way that your coniferous trees do. Lots of trees out there to recommend. The other one I recommend to you, if you haven't heard of it yet, is a hascap. It's kind of like a blueberry crossed with a football. <laughs> it's shaped like a football, and it tastes kind of like a blueberry and a raspberry combined. It's a shrub, grows about up to my waist in height, and uh, really it's one of the earliest fruits that you can get. Alright, let's give you a quick overview of the design. So here we've got another terrace, all these fruit trees and shrubs along it. This is capturing water. It follows the curve of this land. There's going to be a fireplace right here in this middle flat zone with a bunch of uh, stumps that you can sit on around it. Now, coming back around this way, oh, by the way, parents can sit there and watch their kids run down the whole property as they pick and eat food. And over here, we have an auditorium. We're using the curve of this landscape to all face in where you're standing so we can have it at community events here. But why not make it edible as well? The top where you see these flags, that's all fruit trees. We're gonna have cherries, we're gonna have more Saskatoons. It's gonna be great. And then on the lower area, we're gonna have a raised garden bed that comes out of the hillside, okay? And then the front edge of it is actually a bench. So edible landscape all around, great community space for people to enjoy.